ladies and gentlemen, welcome into another awesome, fantastic, and amazing episode of Facts Not Feelings with the one and only Tom Klein. Wahoo! The yes, crowd I was wild. Wahoo! <laughs> yeah, I need to have like applause in the background for you, Tom. <laughs> Anyone that doesn't know you, like, that, first off, they should. Like, I don't know what you people are doing. Get to know Tom Klein. He is a freaking genius. And the more I get to know you, Tom, the more I'm just like, hey, I just need to. First off, shut up and listen to you because you are so brilliant. Every time I talk to you, I'm like, I just learned something new. I just learned something new. So this is why everyone go listen to Tom Klein and get to know him. You are just Thomas with uh, his 30 years in the car ownership experience. And now you you ventured off to Vantage Point, correct? You've been with him. When did you start Vantage Point? Uh, Better Vantage Point Point started. It's okay. In December of 2019. So after we sold the dealerships, that's when I started uh, started it because I found there's a need for it. So here I am. Yes. And I'm just going to kind of go over some of these accolades here. And I, there are so many of them that I had to write some of them down so I wouldn't forget here. But you were recently at presenting a GLB presentation that the, I always have to slow down when I say this because I always go like NAD. I'm like, no, NIADA presentation, a national policy conference. And then, like I said, you have 30 years of dealership ownership experience. And now with a better vantage experience, better vantage point. Why can't I say that right, Tom? Like, I don't know why. Like, it's, yeah, it's. Maybe yeah. you need a better vantage point. I, that's what it is. Or sleep. That that could be it as well. Very possible. So we'll get into today. We're going to be talking about not just GLBA. Well, that's the main point of it. What it is, why it's so important, the good, the bad, the ugly of it, the ADF, ADF XML portion of it. The all inclusive, just breaking it down to the anybody can understand it. And why, in particular, I wanted to speak with you about it. Is you're an expert on this, but with your company, you what you do is you you just uh, dealership disputes, your compliance, risk mitigation, and your consulting is all you do. And so you're living and breathing this. I remember when we were talking. I think it was last week. You go, well, you know, we do risk, risk mitigation. It's just kind of evolved now because GLB's here. That's what we're doing. <laughs> so right. uh, today, like I said, we had there's so many parts of GLBA, and it, if you try to consume it, well, you should have been doing it earlier on. And I know you and I have been screaming this from the rooftops for some times here. But if you try to at the very beginning, you just be like, ah, there's so much to this. I want to break it down into little bite-sized pieces for our audience of what it is. How can I go about doing it? And I know we've got this looming December night the expiration date on everything. So I just want to start with like the basics of what it is first off and kind of build on that and educate our audience on this a little bit, Tom. So sure. I just grant you the floor on this, sir. We're going to, we're going to break it into fun size. Pieces, <laughs> yeah. right? Little bite size pieces. Little yes. Fun size. Size. <laughs> little Kit Kat <laughs> sizes. <laughs> little, little Snicker bars, little, little Milky Ways. Yes, yes, um, yes. So the Graham Leach Bliley Act originally went into uh, via law, I think in 2003 originally, so it's almost 20 years old. And last October, November, they updated the regulations, and now dealerships are required to comply uh, by December the 9th. And to quote an old employee of mine, uh, whose name was Hank, he said, "You don't have to agree, but you do have to comply." Yes. So. Um, so I guess the first component, the first and kind of most complicated and biggest component is that you, all the data that you have, so that's data from your CRM, data from the DMS, data from your websites, data flowing any which way that you have it at the dealership now has to be encrypted both at rest and in transit, both at rest and in transit. And so there's been not enough conversation, actually, about the ADF format, which um, ADF is, uh, if I remember, is auto lead data format, which was started specifically for the auto industry, if I'm correct. Is that right, Brooke? Yeah, I also think of the A and uh, Kevin Fryer joking more like the A and ADF, ADF stands for archaic. Also, I think I like that we like to call it. So yes, yes, but I believe that your your actual acronym is correct. Yes. Okay. So the auto lead data format. So that's how most information flows in the car business. 
And now that has to be encrypted, which means that your DMS provider, your CRM provider, your website provider, really what you should do is go through your payables list, have your payables clerk go through all the expenses in which you pay for internet expenses. And any of those things are going to have to be encrypted starting December the 9th. And that's a big task. So that's why I'm starting with that particular one. Huge. And I'll add to that is that when you start thinking about how these, I, I'll rewind here a little bit, how the form comes into you and where that information is going, it gets a little daunting to say the least, because when that lead comes into you, it's not just going to you, the dealer. And, and that's where I think sometimes you're like, oh, wait, it doesn't? No. That If it's a third party lead, it's going to you. It might be going to another dealership. If it's, a, if it's an OEM lead, the OEM has it now and it's coming to you. And then let's say, okay, I got the lead. It goes into my CRM. Maybe it's going to DMS, should be going to. And then from there, okay, I might be a salesperson or in the BDC. Well, I get that. And then my manager forwards it back to me. So now you're forwarding all the information. Well, then that auto trader gets it and auto trader sending it to all the other places. Well, now I have constant contact. Well, con con constant contact. Well, I'm going to left all this stuff here and then they're sending it here. And so there's just this spider web of where all this information is going. And it's OK. So how how are we getting all this in there? And there have been some people that have been talking about this. I know that you, you and I have been talking about this. A tool has been talking about this or we've been talking about this. I know Brian Pash. Who else is kind of working towards this? And there's not a there's not a fix right now per se but who was who's trying to work up to a resolution on this so so let me just fill in a quick definition based on what you just said okay so the, so the definition of pii or personally identifiable information has changed yes so that's a that's an important nuance here because now your home address your cell number and your email address are all considered pii so for those of us who are uh, over 20 years old, we say to ourselves, wait a minute, there was a phone book not too long ago. Yes. And the, and the answer to that is yes, but that's now all considered PII and you have to protect it. So okay. you mentioned emailing the information starting December the 9th. You can't email any PII unless your email is encrypted. So I think that as a kind of a, a basis is important to know. Now, as far as who is working on this, other than the list you just made, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of when we're talking about just the data, if we're talking about other software that supports this, which I know we're going to get to in a few minutes, there are some other companies that, that support parts of the Graham Leach Bliley in different ways. But as far as the data goes, I am not aware of any other companies that are, uh, that are working on this at the moment. So before we jump into the next part, which you just mentioned, I, I want to make it very, very clear when someone says that we are making you 100% compliant, we just said that they don't do the ADF XML portion, you're not 100% compliant. So well, it's, there's no, there's no, let me just say it more broadly, Brooke, there is no one solution that can you. make you 100% compliant on this. As examples, and I we're going to talk about it later, you have to do a risk assessment of your IT infrastructure. You have to check for security vulnerabilities. You have to check for security patches. And it, none of that is done in a software program. That is just your IT guy in good old fashioned shoe leather, uh, <laughs> walking around the dealership, seeing what problems there are, right? So there is no one solution or one person or one company uh, that, that, has a, a an all-in-one solution that I'm aware of uh, that can do all this. Now, I do know there are claims of some folks doing it, but those are claims as far as I know. Yes. Happy to, happy to be proven wrong. Please, <laughs> yeah, yeah. please reach out to me by email or LinkedIn or whatever. I'm happy to be wrong because if there yes. is a solution, I'm happy to tout it and send some customers your way. Oh, that makes two of us, two of us. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, which is why people are asking me questions about this, you have to parse it out and you have to kind of work on this um, in, a, in a logical way. So the first way I think is securing your data 
uh, reaching out to Brian Davis, uh, Atul Patel, Peter Fong, uh, any of the folks over at Orbi. Uh, Orbi is kind of a central hub, if you will, for for those people who are watching who don't know, that will help you take control of your uh, your data. So it's now first party data instead of third, and in doing so, will help you encrypt it both uh, at transit and and at rest. So. Um, and then first party data, just once again, I might want to make this so everyone understands we're not throwing around crazy. If we if we say a crazy acronym, I'm going to try as much as possible to go back and understand, you know, uh, to make it as, as elementary as possible. First party data be your data. That is in your, your CRM. Data. That is your DMS. That is your data. It's not something off of a some list you bought or some whatever. That is your data. That's what first party data is. Correct. And, okay. and a lot of dealers seed that data to these third parties who mm -hmm. hold it, and then some of them, some of them resell it after they give it to you, yeah. perhaps. Perhaps at a cost, perhaps. and then after lots and lots of begging. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we kind of set a ground of what it is, but not getting into nitty gritty. So let's go over some of like the rules of it, some of the going into a little bit deeper of what it is and we'll get into the software, but let's go into some of the rules. And you have an incredible document that, I, that you sent over and I was just like, okay, I knew some of this, but man, there's a lot of, a lot of nitty gritty. And so like the compliance management system, who's responsible, what is that? What is the compliance management system? Well, the compliance management system doesn't specifically speak to Graham Leach Bliley, but the compliance management system is something that's required by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to make sure that you are documenting law and logging any consumer complaints that come into the dealership and how you resolve them. So if any regulator walks into your business, whether it's the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the attorneys general, uh, of each state, because each state has an, a, an attorney general, they get involved with uh, car dealers, politicians. There's everybody loves to regulate a car dealer, yes. uh, unfortunately. Yes. So um, and and so you should be able to show these regulators what you do to resolve consumer complaints. I always say seventy to eighty percent of a dealership's problems start with consumer or employee complaints. Mm -hmm. And that's who goes to the regulators and that's who who causes problems and goes to lawyers. So if they ever come in to audit you, um, that's that's if you can show them that you're handling your consumer complaints, then as I like to say, you're gonna write a four figure check instead of a bigger, <laughs> a, a bigger check than that. Now I've also been asked very frequently, Brooke, are they going to, on December the 10th, are people going to swarm into the dealership and make sure you're compliant on the Graham Leach Bliley Act? I'm not the Federal Trade Commission, so I don't know. That's my business guy disclaimer. <laughs> so I don't know, but I foresee the way this happens is that if you've got a lot of consumer complaints, that they are going to come in as a result of the consumer complaints. And while they're there, they're going to say, show me your policy, show me your procedures, show me your book, show me your documentation, show me everything. So I think, I mean, similar to Napleton Automotive when they were fined $10 million earlier in the year and Tate Automotive that started many years ago. Um, these, these all started with customer complaints. Uh, so I, I think that's how it starts. They may have a uh, Graham Leach Bliley task force. I don't know. It hasn't been publicized yet, but I don't think that's how it starts. I think it starts with complaints and enough customers complain, uh, complain to the FTC. I think then they come in. I wrote an article, by the way, which might interest you. And, and it's yes. called, it's called let the government be your customer service department. And <laughs> And and what I mean by that is if you don't take care of your customers, the government's going to come in and make sure they're taken care of. And that's going to lead to a hefty fine, which leads me to the next one. Before we get into the other questions, so with the GLB, these, these fines are not, hey, I'm just going to, you know, make an app and it will go away. No, these fines are hefty. So talk a little bit what's going to get them in trouble and then the fines that ensued with those, with getting yourself in trouble. 
Sure. So fines start, as I understand it, at $46,517. I see. Per violation. Now, yeah. nobody knows what a violation, what the definition of a violation is, right? So if you have 10 names that leak, then is that 460,000, right? Yeah. It's unknown. And I think they probably left it that way to, to have the uh, potentiality of, of bigger fines, you know, be there to dissuade you from, from non-compliance or what I say is willful non-compliance, which means you're not even trying to comply. Yeah. So um, that's where the fines start. And I don't remember part two of your question. <laughs> so part two. So there's, there's so much to this. So breaking it down of what are the main, because we could go on and on. I know you and I could talk forever about this. So what are some main bullet points of the GLB Act, the FTC privacy uh, rules and for auto dealers? What are some of those main points that dealers can, if they haven't done it, they should be doing it. But hey, what should you be doing right now? So the first thing is the data. Um, I think the... Uh, the data, making sure your data is secure. I think that's absolutely the first thing. The second thing is multi-factor authentication. So MFA, which is a pain in the neck, it's inconvenient, it's not fun, it slows things down, which, which none of us like. Uh, but multi-factor authentication is making sure that you are who you say you are. And um, I've had some of my dealers install a product called Cisco, see the big company Cisco, the name of the product is Duo. And that lets you MFA into your computer in a kind of an easy way. And it's not too burdensome and not too onerous. There's some other products I've seen which are not great. Uh, they don't function very well uh, and people get super frustrated. Uh, don't ask my wife about this because her company has a product which she does not like at all. And and I hear lots of expletives every time she has to try to get into it. <laughs> so um, I, I, think, I think that's the second thing. So once you've got control of your data and, and you're using MFA to get into your, your computers, uh, I think education is the next thing. And you're required to educate all of your employees. I talked to a dealer this morning who said, now I just have to educate my F&I and sales guys and sales managers on this, right? And I said, no, it has to be every employee. So one of the items of education, for example, that we talked about a few minutes ago was the personally identifiable information and you can no longer email customer information back and forth. You can't text it. Uh, you have to do that through a secure uh, portal. And there are software programs that provide that kind of secure portal. Um, so making sure that everybody understands, I would have them sign a policy that says, I understand I can no longer send PII through uh, email or, or, um, uh, or text. Thank you. Gotcha. Uh, interestingly, supposedly, for those who still have fax machines, that's supposedly um, secure. I don't know who has a fax machine anymore. Um, I certainly don't. Uh, that's gone away with the dodo bird. Yeah, but, right. um, but doctor's offices, as an example, like to yeah. use, use that. And, and okay, so that's doctor's offices. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I think the keys to success here kind of touching base on some of the some of the slides that I sent you is making sure your people, your processes, your policies and technology are all together. So there I mentioned earlier there are software programs. There's four or five software programs on the market that will help you with about 30% of the Graham Leach Bliley Act. And what they do for you is they help you with your vendor management. So by vendor management, we're going back to the websites, talking about the websites and anybody who sends uh, data back and forth. So all those vendors have to sign acknowledgements that they're encrypting the data. You have to keep that information. And on a yearly basis, you have to go back and make sure they're still encrypting the data. Uh, and you have to document all that. Um, you have to document um, where, your, where your security vulnerabilities are and what you're doing about it. 
You have to document uh, the employee training. Uh, some of these programs have, for example, one, uh, 12 modules that, that people have to complete, which keeps it top of mind awareness, um, phishing, uh, social engineering, all of those kinds of um, issues and problems. So you have to train on those. Um, as from an IT infrastructure perspective, you have to um, do a, a risk assessment where your vulnerabilities are then you either have to do con it's called continuous monitoring which is having somebody sit behind a glass panel looking at all your data flowing and see if there's been a breach you either have to have continuous monitoring or vulnerability and phishing tests done so it's a lot less expensive to do the vulnerability and phishing testing uh, than it is to do the continuous monitoring. So I'll pause there. If you, that, <laughs> no, yeah, that was, and I think <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> and I think, and I would say, and I'm curious with that is how they hold them accountable because I have been in multiple dealerships where it's, oh yeah, we'll do the fishing tests, but no one follows up with it. So they click on something, they're supposed to do the fishing test, and no one follows up with it. Yeah. So how is how is it that they're they're actually going to enforce that. So some of the software programs will throw you right back to retraining. So if you click on mm -hmm. one of the bad links, you get sent to the penalty box and you have to mm -hmm. retrain and then take a test to make sure that you know. So some of those programs I mentioned have that kind of capability. Yeah, so I, I've definitely worked for companies that would do that. I'm just curious at a dealership level, are they gonna actually, because even if you get sent there, if, the, if at a management level, they just say, all right, we're going to do this, but nah, we're not really going to do it. They're just doing it to check a box because they feel they're, for, they're being forced into this. Just because you get sent there, you really don't have to do it. Unless they're locking them out of their email, how else are they going to, I mean, or take their pay away? If it's right. not that big of a priority to them, like, oh, this is just, you know, BS, we're reinforced to do this, like whatever. If the employee doesn't do it, what happens? Right. Well, this is going to require, it's a great question, and it's going to require kind of a cultural shift yep. at the stores. Um, and and I see a lot of stores, and that goes from small or, you know, single point stores up to stores uh, or, or organizations that have 30 stores. And the first question when they call me and we talk about, generally, I get the well, we have compliance lockdown and don't worry about that. We don't need to talk about that. We just want to talk about this. To which I say, okay, well, let me just ask you one question before we, I said, do you have a compliance clerk or compliance manager at each location? And Brooke has the answer to this question, which is <laughs> Hello. no. Hello. Hello. Really no. <laughs> and so, so unless you have a audit function, behind your compliance program, you don't have a compliance program. Somebody has to check behind it. Whether you hire a company like me or you or you install your compliance program and then you have people on the ground and, and you, ha you have somebody train those uh, compliance folks so that they know what's going on, somebody has to be in charge and all of those people have to report to the owner. And part of the Graham Leach Bliley Act, the new regulations is there has to be annual reports to the board of what the activity was, what happened, what training happened, kind of a holistic perspective uh, of what's going on. And so somebody has to be in charge, Brooke, is the answer. And to, to go back to the old adage of you manage what you monitor, somebody has to monitor this in order to manage it. So with the whole managing thing, that comes to a point of insurance. Well, I don't need insurance, or do I have enough insurance? Well, do my do my vendor partners and business partners do they have enough insurance? And then, so speak to because sometimes I mean I'll go to a story. This is back in I think two thousand, and it might have been two thousand sixteen, maybe I don't know, something like that. And I had a there's a dealership group, uh, and there's their one store got hit with ransomware, and they it was because they didn't have a. They didn't have the Wi-Fi password. They didn't have a Wi-Fi password. 
And so that's how they got hit. Mm -hmm. So I go, okay, make sure all of you, and they paid it. This was ransomware was like on the up rise, whatever. I go, cool. so are the rest of your stores, do they have a password? Oh yeah, yeah, we're good. Three weeks later, boom, their sister store gets hit. Why? They didn't have a Wi-Fi password. I go, you guys just make it like one, I don't care, make it. I prefer that it's something like very strong, but just put something there and they got hit. So in a matter of a month, they shelled out a ton of money. I go, what you guys? So going back to insurance, like you can have the insurance, but if you're not doing what you should be doing, I'm right. going to let you speak to that. So there's a, that's about 22 questions. I <laughs> asked <laughs> Sorry. In that one. That's okay. Let me, let me break, let me break it down. Break it down. Let me break it down. Uh, so, um, first of all, if you're practicing good risk mitigation or good risk transference, the first thing you do is check and see if your vendors have cyber insurance. Most have, even, even though most of their business is done through the cloud and through the internet, most have a million dollars, which is nothing. In today's day and age, it's nothing. So if you're practicing good risk mitigation techniques, you're going to check to see if your vendors have cyber insurance. Make sure that they have ransomware insurance. Usually, if like, if you have a million dollars of insurance, the only amount that's covered by ransomware is usually a sublimit, which is usually like two hundred fifty thousand. So nothing, okay. uh, especially considering a. a a group up in Northern Virginia last year was ransomware for 7 million. So, because auto dealers are targets, that's why, that's the whole point of the Grand leach Bliley Act is, we have everyone's information. We have all their information. We have their name, their social, their birthday, their pay stubs, their job information. I mean, there's nothing really that we don't have. Um, so, so you check to make sure if your vendors have cyber insurance and if they don't, you can use leverage on them, negotiate with them, have them increase their limits, have them sign that per, that in the case of a breach, their insurance is primary. That's a lot of work, what I just said in 30 seconds. <laughs> however, however, and then and then you need to decide what your risk appetite is for um, you having cyber insurance. Let's talk about risk appetite for a minute. Risk appetite is you understand what the risks are and you're comfortable that whatever insurance uh, or whatever plan you have in place will ameliorate or stop any problems, right? Because in risk mitigation, there's really two different parts of it. Part one is preventing the problem. Part two is if I do have a problem, how am I going to solve it? So, so those are the two pieces really of, of enterprise risk mitigation. So on the first part, what are you going to do to to not have a problem, that's the Graham Leach Bliley Act. Are you going to encrypt your information? Are you going to make sure credit apps and stips aren't laying around on desks that anybody could go and snap a photo? And I that never photo. happens at a dealership. Never. <laughs> Every time I go into a dealership with my clients, I'm snapping photos before I see the the dealer principal. Let them see what's going on. Um, but then as an example that I'm using these days, assume with the DMS, assume with the CRM that you have uh, re records of 250,000 customers, which is not, it's probably low if anything, right? Between service and parts and sales new and used and F&I and every other thing that goes on lease. Some, some dealerships have leasing companies. Let's say they have 250,000 records and let's say they have a data breach, which is the whole point of this. So if you do, in, if you do quick math and the FTC or the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau makes you do credit monitoring for those 250,000 that were breached, credit monitorings are eight, eight or nine bucks a month. That's a hundred bucks a year. 100 bucks a year times 250,000 names is $25 million. So when you talk about risk appetite, is that a risk you're willing to take as a dealer? Yeah. And I, I'm, I used to be a little bit better at math than I had way too many concussions. But if I'm doing the math on that, which is, like I said, used to be a little bit better at math, mm -hmm. you might be a little low on that. Just given the, the complexity of everything that's included on that, because right. if you're shooting, if you're doing that, plus, I don't know, 
you're the expert on this. No, I mean, I'm saying that's not a, that's not a high number. And I don't know any yeah. dealership. I don't know that any dealership that has 25 million. I've never no. heard of it, never seen it. Mm -mm. It doesn't exist. The highest I've seen is 10 million, which is a, a gracious plenty. But, yeah. but that's, it's not my 30 or $40 million at stake, right? That's the dealer has to make mm -hmm. that decision. Some yeah. dealers are okay with that. And they're mm -hmm. like, I'm okay with having a million. And if I have a problem, I have a problem. I'll deal with it. I'll deal with uh, it. It hasn't happened, as you said. It hasn't happened yet. Hasn't case happened of the yet. yet. Don't get a case of the yet. Hasn't yes. happened yet. Hasn't happened yet. So uh, you, you had said something earlier about uh, customer complaints. And so my question to you about that is, are reputation management companies enough? Because they don't see what's on Reddit. They don't see what's on Twitter. They don't see what's on all the other platforms. There are companies that do, but those reputation management companies don't see that. So where does where does that fall into all this? So I think with all due respect to all those reputation management companies, what they don't do, which is a problem as far as I'm concerned, is who's picking up the phone and calling the customer to get them in to solve the problem, right? The reputation management companies are great, are great at saying, dear Mrs. Jones, we're so sorry we let you down. Please reach out to us and give us the details of your, of your problem when the customer just listed nine paragraphs of what you did wrong, right? So it comes across as insincere. And there's two problems with that. Number one is everybody reads reviews. Everybody reads reviews. So people read reviews before they buy their cars. And so you come across as insincere to new car buyers. That's a problem because you're losing sales as a result of you not handling these complaints. But then if you're not fixing the problem, that customer's just spinning out there and is, is upset with you. And so I've seen customers post across eight or nine different internet platforms. That's when they go to the attorneys general. Um, I've mentioned uh, I've mentioned before that I know of a class action lawsuit that happens that started in church where one lady said to the next, hey, did you get screwed by this dealer? Because I did. And off they were to the races. Right. And that was a seven to ten million dollar problem, as I remember. Um, so so just posting that you're sorry and we'll do better next time. That's not reputation management. Here's that's, a pair of free windshield wipers. Here you go. Yeah, that's that's just posting. That's posting for posting's sake. It's it, it it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't help the customer. It doesn't help the dealership. I don't even really think it helps in general because people see that all the time and it looks insincere to me. Yeah, and and yeah, I'll, yes. And if you see, if you're, I'll just leave it at that before I. Don't want a, a rabbit hole. Okay, well, you can say it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go down a rabbit hole of just some. Th th there are trends, and I've even I've seen it with. Uh, it doesn't matter what industry it is. There's a, a trend of okay, well, if I complain because our culture is we complain and we're just going to vent because the good pe the ones that have a good experience they don't say it. So if I just complain, oh, I'm going to get something for free. Well, that's then you just train your customers to bitch and get stuff for free. That shouldn't be the way. Figure out okay what actually went wrong because it may be something never maybe something didn't go wrong. They're just looking for a handout. So figure out okay did we actually do something wrong? Is there something where something where we can improve our processes? Because I want to get better. I just right. don't want to give out handouts and cut into our gross profit or cut into service or cut into whatever it is. Figure out what happened. Where can we improve? And that's just I mean. That goes with any industry, any industry, figure out what happened and, and figure out, talk to both sides. Does something actually happen and go wrong? Or is this person just looking for a handout because they want to complain and post everywhere? So, and, and there's two, there's two good points that you bring out there. Number one is listen to the feedback on the internet because the customers may be telling you as an, I'm going to use this as an example, that if you've got three complaints about a salesman where there's smoke, there's fire, right? Yep. So use the feedback as information to operate your business. I think we all get complacent and tired of listening to that. And it's just another customer complaint when in reality that can help us run our business. Um, yes. Secondly, when you do have those who are trying to take advantage, I still think you have to satisfy them in some way. I'm not telling you have to give them what they 
want to get, but I think you have to satisfy them and then consider putting in place a process where whoever that person is that's handling it will get the customer to sign a release of all claims so they mm -hmm. don't come back to you a second time and mm -hmm. say, well, now that you fixed my tires, uh, I mean, <laughs> I, had, I had a customer come back to me 13 years after we did a paint job in our body shop and say we did a terrible paint job because look at, the, look at how the paint is flaking. <laughs> right what? so so i i satisfied the customer but i didn't give them a new paint job no um no. but they I signed a, they signed a release yeah. uh, i can i can assure you so so i think it's important to to just to make an internal distinguishment between that which is um not based in reality and that which is based in reality and you can have two different procedures to to handle those yes Okay, so when it comes to employees, like when it's with this, you have now have to have a way that employees can channel and a mechanism for them to bring complaints to management. So my question with that is, how do you ensure that it's a safe place for them to do that? Once again, that it's not, it's a culture shift. I'm, I'm fully aware of that, which is a little difficult in some circumstances. But so maybe, I don't know, maybe well, you can't answer this. Well, I'm difficult in some circumstances. <laughs> so how, I mean, how can is just having a GLB okay? Well, you got to do it because you got to do it. Is that really going to happen? Well, I don't. I don't think they're. I don't think the Graham Leach Bliley Act really interfaces the customer complaint issue. It can if there's a breach, right? You don't want to call a third generation customer and say, "Hey, your information's now on the dark web." Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, you don't want to have that conversation either publicly, privately, or otherwise with the media or whoever it is. Um, no. And, and, but, you know, it needs the customer complaints need to be satisfied. And that's just kind of where that is. And you can choose to ignore that or you can choose to embrace it. But I think the paradigm shift comes in when you designate someone to say, this person is going to handle customer complaints. Um, sometimes sales complaints can be handled differently than service complaints because it's just the nature of those complaints. And, and I think that's fine. If you're going to separate, let the fixed ops guys handle the fixed ops problems and let sales, let somebody up in sales handle the sales problems because generally, uh, fixed ops issues aren't, but so expensive, right? They, they can only be, they blew the engine blew up, I guess is kind of probably the maximum service problem in terms of dollars right but on the sales side you know their average car i read this morning is now up to i think forty one thousand yeah, dollars like um so you know somebody doesn't get somebody's stips are false or they really have a job and you said they didn't and you repoed their car and they've got embarrassment and all this other stuff right that can add up quickly uh and those problems can balloon very quickly so i think that you have a designated person they're the ones that vet all the information they talk to the customer they talk to everybody internally they should have a direct line to the dealer or owner and know how much they can spend or can't spend without authorization and then i think they're the ones who solve that problem so i think that's kind of how you have to get around that uh though it can be that the sales managers will use that person as their personal customer service department. And that obviously becomes a problem. Just like when used car managers start adding warranties to cars instead of reconditioning them, it's the same kind of thing, right? But that, that becomes so obvious so quickly that, that you're able to, to figure out what's going on there. And I will add to that, that if you're, if you are, an auto group, one person cannot handle every single. No. no, you have to have somebody at each location. Yes, somebody so has got, to be empowered to do that. It, it is impossible for them to do it. So correct. Yeah, yeah. just <clears throat> yeah. Okay, <laughs> so let's go with we we talked a little bit about um, the uh, having auditing the websites, and there are certain states, and I will leave these states out. They know what states they are, where the DOT wants to be the OEM. They want to be in CIRA. And so you'll have in, you'll have in CIRA that will say, no, you, you need to have, and, and you, your 
website needs to say this or your pricing is not correct. And the DOT will say, nope, it needs to say this. Now you've got someone else that's your auditor that's taking care of, hey, your website needs to be compliant with X, Y, and Z so you're, you stay compliant with the GLBA. So what happens when you have differing opinions and views on what is right versus what is wrong uh, post December 9th? You're talking about for advertising? Is that for ad, yeah, for advertising. Yeah, for advertising and uh, being compliant with advertising laws. Because we like for I'll say, for instance, like Wisconsin, Wisconsin is very, very strict. The DOT is, hey, if you have MSRP, you got to show MSRP. You like everything has to be compliant. And they're just very, very strict about it. Yeah, I think there's two sources of information there that dealers can rely on. Number one, the NADA has a 94 page guide called the NADA guide to advertising. Um, and I think if you look at that, and you comply with that number one, and then reach out to your state motor vehicle dealer board. They'll have the regulations written out in some way. I think between those two, you handle the federal and you handle the state very efficiently. But you're right. I mean, for example, Virginia is different than New York. Mm -hmm. New York, you know, fees, some fees are included and some fees aren't. Um, but the biggest mistake that I see when I audit websites uh, for advertising violations is something very simple, which is the disclaimer that says plus processing fee where uh, taxes and tags, the disclaimers at the bottom of the page of the website, whether it's the VDP or wherever it might show up, but there's no asterisks yeah. tying the sales price down to the disclaimer. Mm -hmm. And the exposure, the liability exposure there is huge because it, from an advertising perspective, if there's no asterisks, then it's perceived to be included in the price. So taxes yep. and tags are included in that sales price. So if you, on an average, that's probably 3,000 every car deal. So if you sell 200 cars a month, and then times it by 12, and these numbers get huge in terms of the class action exposure. So that's the biggest advertising mistake I see, and I see it over and over. Uh, very few websites are compliant that way. Yeah, it's it's nuts. I mean, it's I got kind of baptized in this a couple of years back. And like, I, I mean, I knew some stuff, and it was I was back in, actually in the dealership world, and I, mean, I, I, I consulted, a, I was in 300 stores a year and had never really like dove into the compliance part of all of that. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is insane. Insane how some of the, you know, once again, I, Chicago is very bizarre when it comes to how they do stuff. And I can say that living here. And I, so it was just very interesting. To me. I was like, okay, I, okay, I understand now. And, and every state's different. So there is, Tom, I could talk to you about this forever. I mean, I, I still have, like, from what we are going through, like another, uh, like, 20 questions here. But for time's sake, I will, I know we got to wrap this up here. <laughs> it, I, we can turn this into the Brooke Furnace Late Show if you want. I know, right? <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> the Facts Not Feelings Late Show here. Now, <laughs> it, it, for anyone that has more questions, Tom, I'm going to put this up here. Where can, for especially for those that are obviously listening in podcast land here, where can everyone find you? Where can they get more information about you? Your uh, better vantage point. I got it right. It took me seven times, but I got it right there. Where can they find you? Yeah, the the quickest, easiest way is to find me on LinkedIn uh, under Tom Klein. Uh, you can certainly reach me by my cell phone, uh, which the number is published everywhere. Um, <laughs> Or my email address, which is Tom K is in Tom Klein at bettervantagepoint.com. So I'm um, uh, easily accessible. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. And he does a lot of speaking on this as well. If you, anytime Tom is speaking as well, take a moment and listen to him. He comes with like a wealth of knowledge. So you'll always learn something from this man. So Thank we'll you. dive into the lightning round here. And yeah. So what is your, <laughs> so much fun, so much fun. <laughs> What is your favorite thing to do outside of work when you're not talking about GLBA or risk mitigation? What are you doing outside of work for fun? I breathe. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing. Keep I breathing. breathe. I sit down. I breathe a little bit. It's really enjoyable. Uh, I, no, I like to, uh, 
I, I, I've, I've had a, a boat most of my life. I don't have a boat right now, both sailboats and power boats. So I enjoy nice. the water a lot. Um, and um, I enjoy hiking. And so those are kind of uh, my, my, I guess it's my seance that I, you know, convene with nature and breathe in and out. And sometimes a nap. That's, mm. you know, nap is a good activity for me on a Saturday or a Sunday. Very decadent. It feels great. I recommend it to everyone. <laughs> I highly <laughs> recommend naps. Oh, the things we didn't, we like for like hate as a child and like, no, just let me nap, please. Just let me nap just right. five minutes, please. <laughs> right. I saw, I saw a meme on Facebook last week that said all the things I hated as a child are now my adult goals, right? Yes. Napping, staying home, going to bed early. <laughs> yes. It's so true. So true. Okay. So aside from napping, uh, let's go into what is your favorite uh, vacation spot? Where are you going? You've got a ticket. Where are you heading to? Oh gosh, I a vacation. I I have some favorites. Okay. Um, I have a little small mountain place in the Blue Ridge Mountains, so that's probably a, a favorite, especially this time of nice. year because the leaves are starting to turn, which is which is my favorite. Uh, but I guess some of the best trips I've been on, I went to. I took my family to uh, Yellowstone in oh, the nice. winter. But nice. it was in the winter, so it's a whole different experience. Um, very cold. I think it's minus 20. Uh, it's really cold, but fascinating seeing all those kinds of things. Uh, I took my son to um, Hudson Bay up in the Arctic Circle to look at the polar bears many years ago. That That's was awesome. That was really a fabulous trip. Uh, and then on on more of the kind of uh, um, usual thing. I love Italy uh, and love to go drink coffee and get gelato. So any any place in Italy, and I do a lot of walking. I, I enjoy walking. I was in San Francisco recently and a close friend of mine and I in three and a half days, we walked 37 miles. So, oh my gosh. So, we, you know, so I, I just like to walk around, see what's, you know, stop, get a cup of coffee, stop, get a loaf of bread, stop, get some ice cream or whatever. So I just like to wander around and just not have a, not have a deadline, right? <laughs> not have to be somewhere. Walk and nap. Okay. We got it. Walk and yeah. nap. Walk, walk, coffee, nap. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> or coffee walk nap. That's going to go that way. Yeah. It's okay. Whatever. <laughs> I actually only drink decaf. That's. Oh, really? That's, yep. I only drink decaf. So I just do it because I like it, the taste, not because of the caffeine. All right. Okay. Think, we're learning so much about you, Tom, right now. So much. Yes. So much. <laughs> yes. Okay. All my secrets. Uh, so the show is named Facts Not Feelings. So whether it's in your personal life or in professional life, what are you constantly distinguishing facts from feelings? I think it's in both in both my personal and professional life. I think when you, first of all, I, the connotation there is a little bit of like when you get something bad or there's something not great happening, how do you react? Mm. And I think the, the what I do for myself is I try to take a deep breath. I try to find out what the facts are so that I'm not reacting or overreacting or underreacting to whatever the information I'm getting. Because usually the information that's provided to you, whether it's somebody telling you you're an idiot or so, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. It's usually not the real information. The first information you get is, and you have to parse through it. You have to pick through and find out really what the information is. Once you know, and there's only one reality, right? There's only one set of facts in every situation. And it may, you may not know the facts. And so you have to pick through the information or do some research or find out or whatever you have to do, depending on whether it's personal or professional, and try to find out. Once I have that information, then I feel like I can react to it. Because until you know, you don't know. And so, that's kind of, I, I think that's an answer to your question, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I love it. it that's, I, if only more people would do that, Tom. If yeah. only more people would do that. <laughs> Take a breath, figure out what's the truth and what is real, and then respond. But too quickly, it's, 
Ah! I was like, no, just calm down, calm down, take a breath, take a breath. No, I love it. I love it. Okay, let's go with kind of a little bit on that same one. As a disruptor in the industry, what is, because you're definitely doing that. I mean, you're doing something that not a lot of people are doing. What is the hardest or best lesson that you've learned? Patience. Hmm. Patience is a good one. Yeah. So, in, in, in I'll follow on to the last question, which is when you get information about a business problem, don't react to it because you really, again, you really don't know what it is or what you're dealing with. And so, patience is important. And I think the, the, the add on to that is the way and the timing of your communication about that item. So if it's somebody who works for you screwed something up, you know, how you react to that person, when do you bring them into your office? Do you have all the information? Do you, in other words, how you deal with that person from an interpersonal uh, perspective is super important and and that you know what you're dealing with because i see far too often managers dealers doesn't matter who they fly off the handle and they don't even know what they're talking about yet there's no there's there's nothing to talk about yet they're going high and left when there's nothing to go high and left about yet yeah. You, there's always time to go high and left right <laughs> you can go high and left that's no problem but before you do, the timing and the tone of your communication, I think, is vitally important. And just to take 30 seconds on tone, I think you can have conversation with anybody about anything, but taking the tone out of that conversation, I think, is super important because all too often we have conversations, whether it's with our spouse or with our kids or with a colleague or somebody who reports to you or somebody who you report to and you have tone with them, you can say anything, but when you say it with tone, it takes a completely different, it takes on a life of its own. So I would simply encourage people to not have tone in their conversations unless they're sure that's the tone that they want to have. Amen. Before we jumped on this call, we were emailing back and forth and I just go, you know, picked up the phone. I just go, there's even an email that tone can come across and it's Especially perceived. Email. Yeah. It's perceived tone, but that person didn't mean that. So pick up the freaking phone and call the person, whether it's in text message or email, you may, whether you intended it or didn't intend it, that tone can come across. So pick up the phone first, take a breath, then pick up the phone and call the person. Uh, so, just believe also that that the person intended that with love and empathy and it, 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 they didn't intend it that way. Now they may have, but don't assume that they meant it that way and then have that conversation. So I love that. Very well, very well said. All right. We'll end on a, a fun one. <laughs> All right. What is your favorite car? Uh, the Lincoln Continental with the suicide doors. Oh, that's a good one. No one said that one. That asked this multiple times. Don't answer, answer that one. That's a cool. That's a. That's just. I mean, I'm. Um, like the cobbler son has no shoes. Like cars have never been a thing for me. I'd much rather <laughs> talk about a boat. But as far as you know, the design and the 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 suicide doors are just cool. And I mean. The- they're just cool. And, and I don't know why more car makers don't, don't do them even now um, because they're fun and they're yeah. cool. And it's, e- I think it's easier to get in and out of the back seat. And there's all kinds of reasons why, but that's, that's my answer to your question. Okay. So hold up. We got to end on one last question. What's your favorite boat? You said you're more of a boat person, to, obviously. So we have oh, a favorite gosh. boat. Boats are like shoes, Brooke, right? You oh, need- I know shoes. So yeah. <laughs> you need different boats for different occasions, right? You have to have more than one. You can't just have one boat. Well, I know uh, that feeling as well. So yeah. <laughs> so so it depends on the conditions. It depends on okay. where you live. It depends on what you're going to do with it. Are you just using it for weekends? Are you living on it? Are you going to Bermuda on it from terms of where I am, which is Bermuda 600 miles due east of where I am. So um and I have been to Bermuda on a boat before. So 
um, you know, it, it, it really depends on, on, you know, like, it's like shoes. You, sometimes you need hiking shoes. Sometimes you need four inch heels. Sure. Um, I don't need four inch heels, but you, but you might. No, you know. no judgment, no judgment on the yeah. show. No judgment. <laughs> <laughs> judgment free zone. <laughs> oh, Tom. Well, thank you, Tom. It has been such a, such a pleasure to have you on the show. So appreciate it. Everyone, if you, like I said, if you've not had a chance to sit down and chat with this man, well, you just did. You just did, ladies and gentlemen. Right. He is a brilliant human being. Uh, we, like I said, we had way more to discuss. We could definitely make this a part two or part three or part four at this point. So much knowledge and there's so much more to discuss. If you, you should already be pretty much done with this. If you haven't reach out to this man, he can definitely get you set up with whatever you need to get you pointed in the right direction. And everyone, thank you so much for joining. I know you've got a choice to listen and watch where, whatever and however you want, wherever you want to watch. I so appreciate it. And as always, as always, find a way to serve today. Help your neighbor, help your colleague, whether it's a kind smile, whether it's opening a door for someone, just find a way to serve someone a day. And with that, everyone, we will see everyone next week. Thank you.